It is my birthday, so I get to share my favorite message, which is on grace. It is my absolute favorite message. Anything to speak about grace. We've been, as a, as a tribe, we've been entering into more of God's fiery love. We've been in awe of him. You know, we're following, we're feasting on the feast. I don't, you know, if you're new, we're, we're feasting as God put out feasts so that we can know how to move in certain seasons with his heart and what to focus on. So for 10 days, we're focusing on the fear of the Lord, like to be in awe of him. And we've been doing that, right? It's been so good just to, to, to feast and say, God, you are so big. You are so awesome. You, are, you know, there's something about getting outside of ourselves. We can get really in, inward, in our heads, right? In. And man, that, that space can be noisy and that space can be loud and that space, we need to get out of that space. Does that make sense? Come on, we need to get out of that space. And it's good and healthy for us to get outside of that space, so inward, and get our focus on God and how big he is, how awesome he is, how majestic he is. And then, and then now we're moved, we moved starting Friday night into the Feast of Tabernacles, which is amazing because the scriptures say that God now tabernacles with us. That means he dwells within us. So this big, magnificent, awesome, holy, glorious God says, I'm going to make my home in your heart. How does that, what? I mean, what? What? Even the fact that in his glory and majesty, the only way we could look upon him was for him to wrap himself in humanity, wrap that glory Wrap humanity around that so he could speak and walk and talk amongst us as Jesus in the form of his son. That's pretty amazing that he'd say, I'm going to step out of all the glory of heaven. It's glorious. No sin, no sickness. Everything's really awesome in heaven, right? Like, like it's just beautiful the way it was always meant to be because God's heart for us was never to be in this place of brokenness in a cursed world. That wasn't his plan. And he, but he did have a plan on how to take us out of that. He did have a plan. And it's called, his name is Jesus, who wrapped himself, took the glory of God, wrapped himself in humanity. We're talking about this, Raleigh, right? The revelation. We've just been getting some cool revelation, right? And he sat there because Raleigh says, what would it be like if Jesus came and sat right here with us in this tent? And said, okay, let's just go there. Let's just imagine what that would be like. And then God started giving more revelation. Like, wow, in order to do that, I mean, we couldn't, we couldn't, we could not handle the glory of God. Like we're not, this body, why do you think we need new bodies in heaven? <laughs> These bodies can't handle all that glory, you know, like the, the fullness of that. So God wraps himself in humanity, said, I'm going to come and I'm going to walk with them. I'm going to talk with them. I'm going to show them the way to my father's heart and how to receive a kingdom, how to receive love and how to walk that out in, on the earth and how to bring the glory and the goodness of heaven to earth. And so we get this amazing privilege. We were made for this. We were made for greatness. We were made for supernatural. We were made to be powerful. Not in our power, in his, right? But we were made to be powerful. There's nothing wrong with a sense of, I, I need to, I, I, I'm powerful. But it's, it's a different, it's not like power like the world grabs a hold of the lust of power. But we are to be powerful people that yield our lives to a powerful God who somehow determined in his heart that he was going to work through the frailty of humanity, the weaknesses and frailty of our lives, and bring demonstrations of a kingdom, another realm. Listen, this generation is fascinating. They should be with other realms, whether in gaming, whether in, you know, wherever, in movies, they're taking it other realms. Why? Because we're made for that. We are made for heavenly realms. That's our home. The kingdom of God is our home. This is temporary, right? So what do we need? God wants, God says, I want to give you everything. Listen, he's not, he doesn't leave us orphaned. We are children of God. We lack nothing. Whenever lack comes to try and Steal from your life. Wage war on that, beloved. Wage war. We are not people of lack. Listen, he gave. He's a generous, generous God. Because there's glory in heaven, all these riches. And he says, I want those riches on earth. I want those riches 
displayed through you, the glorious riches in Christ Jesus, I want displayed in your life. He said, I want that, and I'm generous. How generous is our God? Well, let's see. <laughs> if, if, if it was only that he gave his one and only son as a gift to the world, if that was, if that was it alone, that would be more than enough, right? To show us how much he loved us. He gave us his son. His son, no, this has to sink in. His beloved son, part of his very being. He said, I'm going to show them how much I love them. I'm going to come to earth. I'm going to walk with them. I'm going to talk with them. And I'm going to show them the ultimate act of love. I'm going to lay down my life so that they could live with me forever. And I'm going to show them that kind of love, that kind of forgiveness. That kind of redemption, it's so beautiful. But God, he gives us his word. He said, I'm going to give you a roadmap. I'm going to give you my, my written word. I'm going to give you the word so that you can, that can be an anchor for your soul, that you can, you know, you have my words. But, I'm, you know, Jesus became the living word, you know, the living. And now we're becoming living testaments of God. Do you, do you know, like, think of the Bible this way. It is the greatest love story ever written. Think of it that way when you read it. And think of it like, I'm invited into these pages. I'm invited into the story. I'm just not reading about God and about his people who did awesome things, who, well, had, had many, the Bible shares many things, failures, successes. But, but with God, it's like he invites us in. And he says, you're part of my story. The story lives on in your heart. Why do we have such a pull for destiny? Anybody have a pull for destiny? Like, I'm made for more than what I'm in right now. We should. Let that pull. Let, embrace that pull. Don't get, don't, I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. Embrace the pull, pull because it's never too late in God's kingdom. Man, he can do stuff quick. He'll do as quick a work in you as you are ready to yield and surrender. I've seen people just get saved and have years and years and years of just tragedy and pain. And I've seen them yield them, their lives quickly. And I've seen God do a quick work. It, but it all is dependent upon yielding, surrender. It's all a life of surrender. And that life of surrender is trusting God. It's trusting his heart towards you. It's trusting and yielding to his good leadership. It's, it's knowing that he is good and he is for you. And we live in a broken world and, and bad things happen and pain's real. And what I love about Jesus, true, the true Jesus, the true representation of Jesus and the church is that he has compassion for people in pain. Do you think there's a world out there right now in a little bit of pain? How about a lot of, how about a lot of pain? How about a lot of pain? What was Jesus' answer? to people in a lot of pain. Did he social distance? What did he do? Let me bring you a kingdom. Let me show you a kingdom. Let me show you our Father's love. Let me show you. Let me demonstrate. No, I'm not there yet to the point where I'd be bold enough to go, I'm going to break this barrier and I'm going to bring healing. It's going to happen every time I do it. But I'm in process and I will be there. And you will too if you'll determine in your heart that nothing's going to stop the power of God and the transforming work of his spirit to transform you into an image that looks like the real Jesus. Would the real Jesus please stand up? The world needs it. Not the religious Jesus. What is this? What is that thing he does? <laughs> Not the... Help me out, Lisa. This? Ah, uh, this. Not the religious Jesus. The one who is full of compassion, who didn't condemn the world, but saw people in pain and called greatness out of them and said, my grace is sufficient for everything that you need. And today's message is about, the, the, the core of it is about God's grace is sufficient. For his power is made perfect in what? Our weakness. What? <laughs> that is called opposite of the world. Yeah, that's it's meant to be. Everything in God's kingdom is opposite of the world and the flesh. And he, no wonder why it's quite a process for us to be transformed out of thinking according to world systems, thinking according to 
our natural tendencies in the flesh. He's got to take us completely out of one realm, one world, into the kingdom realm. And there's grace for that. And there's principles of living out of this realm that we have to grab hold of. Many principles, kingdom principles. Jesus spent a lot of time. The kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven is like this. Therefore, grab hold of these principles and you will dwell in those heavenly places with me. And you will operate because we're not waiting to die to get to heaven. <laughs> We've got God's presence, the very the heavenly being, the very presence of God in us. That's what this tabernacling is all about. He, again, gave his son, gave his word. He gave his Holy Spirit as a gift. So right now, each one of us, if you have received Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. He's, and Holy Spirit's really fun, really cool. I don't know why most of, a lot of the church is afraid of Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is wild and cool and does amazing things, and it's so fun to understand that part of God because that's when it gets, that's when it gets fun. <laughs> that's when it gets fun. <laughs> I mean, we, I mean I'm, come on, all of it's good. The love of the Father, a Father who loves us unconditionally. The power and passion of Jesus who laid down his life and showed us the passion of his love. And then the power of Holy Spirit that just says, come on, we're going to do this. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to train you. I'm your teacher. I'm your trainer. We got a full-time trainer. <laughs> we got, we got, and, and it's, it's cost Jesus everything. It didn't cost us anything. We just got to like value this trainer. Okay, trainer, do your work in me. Okay, train me. Let's train, train my gaze, train my emotions, train my, train my mind. Train me up. <laughs> so he gave us his son. He gave us his word. He gave us his Holy Spirit, which his job description is in his name. Holy Spirit. What do you think he's producing in you? Holiness. <laughs> but listen, you can't work it up. You can't make yourself holy. I can't make myself holy. You can't make yourself holy. It's him. And is yielding and trusting him and seeing things and letting his, his spirit just continue to take over. Like if your, your, your soul was a house, he would, he would come in and say, all right, you invited me in the living room. Now I want to come into every, I want to fill the whole house. So everyone gets saved. Everyone gets Holy Spirit in their living room. But the ones who are going to display his glory, the ones who are going to, um, you know, will be the ones that say, come and fill the whole house. Because he's ready to pour out his greater glory to his end time church. It's us. Guess what? Who is that? That's me. It's you. It's us. All right. Bring it, right? But listen, I don't know about you, but I know with me, there are sometimes I'm like, really, God, are you sure? Because <laughs> I know my weaknesses. I know my, you know, I know like the things I struggle with, my insecurities, my fears, and all this. And God's like, I'm bigger than all that. That's part of seeing him in his awesomeness, is to see him bigger than my fears, bigger than my insecurities, bigger than my failures. He's bigger than that. For real. He's bigger than that. And yet he says, invite me into those so I can transform you. So I can bring you out of those places that end up being a trap for your soul. See, God doesn't, con we, 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 when we don't understand his heart and his nature and his grace, when things are confronted of our lives, we will justify them, we'll skirt the issue, we'll kind of try and say it's this, it's this, and this. And God's like, mm. <laughs> I, I want to, he wants to go to places right now in our hearts that will bring us into freedom. His heart is not to condemn us. His heart is to say, invite me in so I can do an amazing work. I can set you. I can bring more freedom. I can show you my way. I, it's always his, I think the biggest thing we need to know is how big he is and then how big his heart is towards us. Angels stand in awe of us. People worship angels. Do you know angels stand in awe of us? The word of God makes it clear. They're like, wow, wow, what you do, what, what you've done for human beings. And, and I'm sure they got to be like, man, they don't even recognize you most of the time. They don't even invite you in. But here they are, the angels standing guard, ready to be there on our behalf. If we'll just speak words of faith, if we'll just agree and stand. Because it says the angel of the Lord encamps around who? Those who fear him. That means stand in awe of him. 
that say you're bigger than all of this. And, and I'm going to stand in faith. I'm going to declare who you are in my situation. I'm going to look for you in my situation. I'm going to listen for you in every situation. And then you're going to bring. I mean, if we will just hold on to him, he will bring it. He will bring the revelation and the breakthrough. We just hold tight to that truth. And he will do it. And so... I'm going to share one personal story. We're going to watch a 20-minute, too, um, short film. And there's two reasons I want to short, uh, show the short film this morning. Because I know there's people with a call to arts and entertainment. I believe that God wants to broadcast <laughs> his testimony, his truth, his, his kingdom reality into arts and entertainment. I love the quality, you know, I love the quality of this. I it was made many years ago, but overall it's done well. And it's a 20-minute short film, which is about transformation and the grace of God and the empowerment. And it does a beautiful job. You, you, you leave, you, you, you know, when it's done, you're like, man, you're inspired. And you realize, you see a glimpse of God's heart maybe you didn't see before. And he doesn't, they don't talk about God at all. It's beautiful. So I want to share that with you because I think it's great. I think it's awesome. God's going to do more and more with that. <clears throat> On a personal note, I'm not standing here preaching at you, to you. I am with you in the journey. God's taking away this, you know, lead, us and them, leadership somehow. Somebody's higher than somebody that's a bunch of, <laughs> you guys say BS? <laughs> oh my gosh, Steve is taking over here, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> ah, it's not, we're to equip the saints, to, we are equipping the saints, and there's not, a, there's not a higher thing. We're all learning, we're all growing, we're going, we're transformed from glory to glory. Leaders, more than ever, need to be surrendered to a transforming presence in order to lead an end-time army. If you're called to leadership, this is no small call, because the weight of that has to grip you. You are called to raise up an end-time group of people to lead them, whether in the marketplace, wherever you're called to lead. Your family, the marketplace, you're called to lead them into days that this world has never seen before. And they're coming. But, it, but what God's doing is eradicating fear. Because this, the, you know, with fear, without, when we just wage war on fear in our lives, we're going to see crazy cool stuff. The greatest demonstrations of a kingdom of God's kingdom like and that's why when when this gets noisy all the all the reports and all the stuff we feel in the realm of the spirit that's why we have to train ourselves to get into the heavenly realms to get up higher to get a different perspective a different vantage point so that we can move with him in the earth in stunning ways this is for real no, for me, in the transforming grace, you know, grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is something we don't earn. It's a gift. Grace empowers us, right? Fear of the Lord says, God, you're so big, and I'm so small. You know, I'm like, oh, my gosh. And then God says, his grace says, but I'm going to empower you to uh, walk in and share my glory, display my glory, carry my glory. And it is by grace alone that that happens, no, what, what is our tendency as people? Our tendency is to try to work that. That's why works. That's why the Bible says you don't work out your salvation with, he says work out your salvation with fear and trembling. What, why does it say that? Listen, salvation at its core, right? When you receive Jesus Christ, when you receive salvation, it is by grace through faith. Nothing we can do right? It's a gift. You can't earn salvation. Never could, never will. It's a gift. He has given you a gift. And when you value that gift, when you see that gift for what it was, like I was such a sinner. I was so far apart from you. I was, you know, in a lot of darkness and your marvelous light came in and you did something that only your spirit could do. I couldn't do it myself. And you receive that gift in your life. It's a gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> Why do you think Paul and the apostles went back to the church and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, you guys started in grace, and where, what happened? <laughs> what happened to that grace that you started in? You know, that's what the apostles did. They went and they looked over the foundations. They said, oh, okay, you started in grace, you're not continuing grace. But there really is this, in order to really walk in, in the of grace, you have to walk in the fear of the Lord. They exist together. You have to, they're two sides of the same coin. Fear of the Lord 
Without grace will get you into religion and works. Grace, without the fear of the Lord, will put you in that place where people think, anything goes, I can live my life, there's grace, I can live my life any way I want. But when you hold those things together, and you realize, and you, you, you enter into the awe and wonder, and then of who he is and how big he is and what he invites us into, and you realize how much you've been forgiven, you realize how weak you are, and you realize, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things in my weakness, he is strong. We fight so much to try and be, religion will fight so much to be like, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> but the kingdom's like, I, you know, most of the time it's like, I am so undone. <laughs> I don't even know, the closer I get to a holy God, the more undone I feel. But then there's grace to realize we're meant to, we got to, we'll, he'll work us through that feeling of un, that we're undone because he likes to come in and establish his glory and his goodness and his truth. So for me, I'm going to share a story. Probably, I'm going to share what I believe. Um, one of the places that I received the most grace in my life. First, I received forgiveness because when I came to Jesus, half my life I did not know Jesus. And half my life I lived according to the world. Very liberal mindset, very liberal in my thinking. Um, very, it, let's just put, I, even, I don't want to even use liberal. I was, um, I did not see righteousness as an issue. Let's just put it that way. I'd rather go there. <laughs> I didn't think there was a righteous standard. I, I lived by my own righteous standard. Let's put it that way. I live by my own righteous standard. Okay, so then Jesus comes in and I realize, man, how forgiven I am. When you have a, you know, I would, let us continue to ask God to reveal what he did on the cross from us and stay with that. Because when we get the depths of what he did, how forgiven you are, you won't hold unforgiveness towards yourself or towards others because you have a revelation of how forgiven you are. You are forgiven deeply, deeply forgiven. And even if you've grown up in the church all your life, um, I've watched as our daughter has grown up in a household where she didn't at all, she was set apart from day one. But somehow or another, I don't know how this works, but it's in the spirit. When I grab a hold of that truth and I walk in this, my daughter gets the benefits of it. And she already knows what it is to be set apart and still has compassion for people and still has her own battles. But something amazing is happening, and that's where she gets, to, she gets to keep going. She gets double portion what we get. It's like, so my freedom becomes her freedom even more. And then her kids, her children's freedom. So we're fighting not only for our freedom, but for our children and our children's children and generations to come. Because what we, what we defeat or what we overcome, they won't have to. And I'm telling you, one of the biggest revelations the church needs and we need right now is the revelation of forgiveness on the cross. Because the, the, too much of the church is walking in unforgiveness. Are you kidding me? That's not even legal in the kingdom of God. You, you can't. It's not. You can't. You can't. When you know how much you've been forgiven. When you know. When you have. You, and I'm not saying you don't have a real process. God's all about real process. Like a real process. Be like, God, you're asking me to forgive. And I'm really having a hard time. This really hurts. But, it, but you forgave me, so God put that forgiveness in my heart. Take it out. I don't, because it's not your way. I want to do things your way. Unforgiveness is not your way. I'm struggling. Come into this place of unforgiveness and help my heart to shift. That's prayer. That's God. That's real. That's our process with him, a relationship. So in my life, I'm going to share my darkest. Ready? I'm going to share my darkest thing. The darkest thing I can think of to today <laughs> that, that God has shown me. I'm not planning on doing anything dark. Don't get me wrong. No. But all of a sudden, all of a sudden you realize, oh, I didn't see that. Closer you get to holy God. Woo, you see stuff you didn't see before. But then grace. But then grace. So I got saved, and, and we're just loving Jesus with all, let me get rid of this, with all that we are. We're loving him with our, all our heart, our soul, our mind, and strength. We're on fire for Jesus, and we are raw as all heck, and we are in process. We are in the modeling agency. We're in the modeling. We're all, we are all about going after fame and fortune and power and all those things that feel really good to the flesh and all those things that, that we got applauded for from a worldly standpoint. And then we get called into God's kingdom, and it's like, opposite world. Everything's opposite. We're called and set apart. We're called to take the narrow way. We're supposed to look different. What? You know, what does that look like? I mean, you know, and we go, okay, God, teach us. 
We couldn't find, listen, we were going through inner healing and deliverance. We were seeing angels and demons. We were feeling and sensing and all these spiritual senses came alive. And we couldn't find a church that wouldn't think we were freaky, that wouldn't even accept us, that would even embrace us. It took a while. <laughs> and when we did, it was beautiful. And God used that to help raise us up. But I'll tell you, my best friend and my best counselor and my best teacher is Holy Spirit. And when someone taught me how to grab hold of the Holy Spirit, to hear his voice, to, read, to look in the scripture and find revelation, it was awesome. And so, uh, you know, it's just so good to have that relationship with God where he's guiding you. Now, we need each other to guide each other as well, you know. I'm, I'm making this suspenseful for my darkest thing. I'm putting it off. Darkest, darkest thing. Anyway, so... It was something as God was going through, and he's like freeing us for more and more. I'm like, God, wow, God. You know, he's, he's starting to transform us. He's, try, he's starting to teach us about identity, who we are in Christ, and that we, that we have an identity in his kingdom as sons and daughters. And, and he started to teach us and, and ground us in identity and what it meant to have a heart that was full of worship towards him and how to put first things first and, and, and putting him first and, and letting him go into places of our hearts that needed uh, him to change. Well, for me, I'm, I'm, God's raising us up pretty quickly because we're yielding really quickly. We are all in. We said, God, we're all in. Now listen, we thought that every Christian was like that. We got a rude awakening and went to the church because we got radically saved by God. And we said, we've been doing it our way, God. Now we're going to do it your way. We went to the word of God. Teach us your ways. We're going to do it this way. We're going to do it according to the word of God. We're going to live our lives according to this roadmap. And you're going to get us there because you called me. <laughs> you called us. You know what you're doing. <laughs> you called us. Here's your roadmap. So we looked at it. So in, in the process of that, we're on fire. I'm speaking at women's conferences that we're doing, you know, all kinds of ministry. God's just doing a quick work. And, and, but I had this place in my heart that I was like, God, and he kept saying, Renee, you're going you're gonna to help people to embrace my grace by sharing your testimony, by sharing your real process of the things I do in your heart. And so there was many things I was willing to share, but there was one thing I said, God, I just can't do that. I can't share that. And that was my choice for abortion. I, I, before becoming a believer, I chose abortion. And with that, when I became a believer and I went to the word of God and saw that we were fearfully and wonderfully made from our mother's womb, I went, <gasps> what, what does that mean? I mean, what does that mean for me who chose abortion? <gasps> I'm a murderer. You know, I'm like... I you know, talk about shame. I mean, that really hit my heart, for real. I did not see it at all that way. I was blind. You cannot expect blind people who don't know Jesus to live by your moral standard. It does not happen. They are blind. They got to receive Jesus, and then it's a process from there. And so for me, I was like, Ugh. I mean, it literally, I mean, I was like, I felt like I throw up. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, Lord. Lord, like, and I felt so much shame, so much condemnation, because I saw it for what it was. I never saw it that way before. But here, here's the grace, beloved. Here's the grace in this. God, it's when you see it that he said, now it's time. You're ready, because he knows when you're ready to go there with him. And I was ready, even though I didn't feel like I was, because it felt very dark and very much like a place I, I didn't even know how to invite him in or even. He said, I would share and I'm like, I will, I will not share. I will not be sharing that one, <laughs> you know. And so what he started to do in that place, I started crying out to him. I'm like, God, I'm just so, this is hard. You know, I'm like, I, you know, I'm a murderer. I see it now. And, and he said, okay, let's go there. And so he said, let's go to the word of God. And he started to lead and guide me. And he said, well, let's look at Paul. Let's just take a look at Paul. Go in the word. All right, Paul. Wow, Paul, before he was Paul, what, he was Saul. Oh, my God. Saul, he was a murderer. He killed so many Christians and families. And you called him, you called him, that guy, the murderer of Christians, to be one of your greatest disciples? Holy Spirit started to say to me, Renee, I forgave him. I called him, I set him apart. You were forgiven. Yes, you were murdered. I had to own it first. I had to own it first. It's hard to own such a dark place. I had to really own that I was a murderer to get free of it. 
So what does the enemy try and do? What does your flesh try and do? Avoid the very thing that's going to bring you freedom. You got to go to those places. You got to face your fears. You got to have courage. You got to go to dark places. You got to get to the root of what's going on. You got to get there with him, with everything in you, because he needs people free. He needs us free. And I was so I was so stunned at I'm just so in awe of how he did it because he he showed me first the life of Paul and he said I've called a murderer to become one of my greatest disciples I have called you this is not you know and you are forgiven so then you're uh, you know you're undone by that you know and then there's another thing that still have to maybe share that you know with people and I'm like okay that's another layer of freedom because um, because there's still layers of shame. Right? And so with that, it's like the way he did it just blew my mind because I found myself, I'm going to Washington, D.C. With a, with a bunch of fiery intercessors who's like, we're going to D.C. and we're going to be stand at the, at the courthouse and we're going to put these tape on our mouths that say life and stand for the unborn the abortion issue. I'm like, oh my God, what? I've got this tape, tape on my mouth that says life and I'm standing in front of the, I find myself, I'm like, oh my God. And I've, I've, I've been working this out with God, but I haven't told anybody. And here I am with this tape on my mouth, and all of a sudden, God just starts, like, downloading his heart and even more of his forgiveness. So as I took a stand in the very area that I participated in, he brought, set me completely free when I stood for the unborn. Come on! That's God! Only God can do that! Only God can do that! Only he can do that! Tears running down my face, going, God, I see it. He gave me this poem of, like, uh, abortion from the perspective of a baby in the womb. Like, started crying out like the baby, saying, Mama, I thought this was a safe place. Mama, I thought you, this is a safe place for me to grow. What's going on? You know, it's like crazy. It was like, wow. It was like, and I saw it, and I was like, and God just set me free. And so in that, I, now I know the process. So, right, I... We're going from glory to glory. There are things that God still reveals in my heart and will continue to reveal. But guess what? His grace is sufficient. I know his heart. I know when he takes me someplace. And I don't, here, I'll tell you another thing don't do, because, or another, uh, uh, some wisdom. Don't go seeking it out. God, what's wrong with me? Show me. Ah! <laughs> and you do want to put the pieces of your, the altar of your heart before him. You search it and be confident he will let you know if you're sincere about that. But you don't have to go dig and dig and dig unless God is leading, unless God is revealing. you got to be really real with, I'm putting it here, and as you show me things, we'll walk in it, right? It's good. It's all good. But we have to invite him in. He doesn't bypass our free will. So his grace is sufficient. His power is made perfect in our weakness. He redeems all things. Some of our greatest weaknesses, some of our what the enemy used is what God is going to, it's like, God almost likes, he's like, for someone who's a, who spent most of their life as a liar, I'm going to have them proclaim the truth. For those people who just avoided conflict all their lives, I'm going to make them deal with great conflict, because they're going to know it's me, because, you know, <laughs> it's just the way he does it. It's like, okay. So, um, it's like, so we, I love, again, this, this short film called Butterfly Circus, because it shows how people's lives um, were in one place, but because of the way God saw them, this, 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 the way that you see, it's not God, but a person who represents God in the movie, who's like, the way he sees people in their weakness, the way he sees people in their shortcomings, and how he relates to them and calls them, it really shows you and gives you grace, a real uh, incredible picture. So one of the most stunning examples in creation which showcases the transformation process so beautifully is that of a caterpillar transforming into a butterfly. Do you, can anybody else get kind of excited about that? <laughs> can we? Yeah, there you go. It's really, I, what? That is crazy. I just love it. There's parallels. God shows us stuff in many ways. But, you know, there's four. There's the egg. There's the caterpillar. The, there's the um, chrysalis. Or the, cat, the egg, the caterpillar, chrysalis, and butterfly. Four stages. And I just want to touch on those a little bit. Uh, you know, again, imagine like in the egg stage, just like us being born again, right? We're born again, and, and God brings us, and we're born again of his spirit. And, and we're just like this little caterpillar <laughs> running around, right? We're just worming it on the ground, and we're just this like chubby little caterpillar <laughs> going, I love you, God. Thank you for <laughs> saving me, you know? And, and then he's like, but God always sees you as a butterfly. 
God sees us in full flight. He sees the beginning from the end. He sees us as that butterfly. But we're, we start as a caterpillar. We start born again, coming to God's kingdom. We're crawling around. He's like, okay, we're going to start this transformation process. I love it that, you know, like they say that um, the monarchs lay their eggs on milkweed plants. It's so fun because when you first get in the word, it says you need milk as a believer, right? So he puts us on milkweed. I, I, you know, I don't know. I think it's kind of fun. Um, it can be fun. So that's what they do. And then caterpillars. Um, so when the caterpillar then is growing, it, it continues to, feed, to, to be in the leaves and, under the, and, in the, and feast off the milkweed plant. Um, I'm just going to read a few facts. It'll be easier. Monarch life cycle um, caterpillar fact. Caterpillars are divided into five larval st larva stages called instars based on their stage of development. To make a massive growth spurt of 3,000%, from instar one to instar five, five is the number of grace, five stages. A caterpillar will molt, shed its skin five times. What is this number? Grace, five times in a two week period. Oh, <gasps> that's molting. <laughs> that's some fast molting. And then the fifth instar, the caterpillar will shed its skin to reveal the chrysalis underneath. So the chrysalis, we, sometimes we refer to it as a uh, cocoon, but it's really a chrysalis. Cocoon is not the... So a monarch butterfly um, spins its chrysalis, and that's the stage three. So they go through molting. That's kind of like the grace in our changing. Even this butterfly, we're kind of molting. We're getting rid of the old skin, the old ways, the world. Those are coming off. But remember, we're made to fly. Remember, we're made to you know, display beauty and glory. So the monarch butterfly then goes into, I love this part, this is the main emphasis. Goes into a chrysalis stage. The caterpillar hangs upside down in a J shape. What? I see Jesus in that. <laughs> J shape before shedding its skin to form the chrysalis. A butterfly chrysalis is not encased in silk. The only silk a monarch caterpillar spins in a chrysalis is chrysalis creation is that which will use to hang itself from. So it only, the only part is this thin silk that they're hanging from. Does that feel a little vulnerable to anybody? Does anyone ever feel like you're hanging from a thread in life? <laughs> And with this life in Christ, it's like this chrysalis. It's like this chrysalis is hanging by this little thread, and they're encased in this to be to be transformed. I can't think of a more vulnerable place that this caterpillar could put itself. You know, but yet somehow. So this is what comes in. This is so cool. <laughs> On the chrysalis, there are gold dots. They're glimmering, sparkling gold in the sunlight. They are like dots or like, and these gold dots serve the function of oxygen exchange that doesn't, an, but it doesn't answer why they're gold. They're gold for some reason, for some reason. I think God, I think our creator had something to do with that. They're gold for some reason, but it is so that they can, there's oxygen exchange in when they're encased. Now imagine this, we're encased in God's glorious presence, his, his wraparound presence. We're encased in this place of transformation with him in his love, in his love. And so he does, it says, what I love about this, it says, glimmering, sparkly gold in the sunlight. The question is often answered, why? Why dots and dashes? The gold dots serve for oxygen, but they also, gold, I guess, the word chrysalis in the Greek <laughs> means gold. And so in that, the gold reflects and it deters, it deters, it scares away <laughs> predators and acts as camouflage. So golden studs, dashes, and leafing reflect the surrounding area, creating flashes of light that looks like drops of dew, shafts of light, and in some cases may frighten the predator when it sees its own reflection, confusing the enemy. I like that. So man, okay. <laughs> 
our greatest warfare is going to be get more glory, right? That's our greatest warfare. And, of course, the enemy is going to resist us in being transformed from glory to glory. Glory in the word of God. Glory is depicted by gold. When we think of glory and, and, and the color gold is that there's this gold line through this chrysalis that is declaring and reflecting glory and causing confusion in the enemy's camp, creating oxygen to flow in this place that you feel so entrapped, you feel so enclosed in, or, I mean, there's one of two things. You can feel entrapped and closed in, or you can feel safe and secure. It's God who makes it feel safe and secure. We often say, we got to feel safe in the fire of God when the intensity comes, when, he's, when he takes us into narrow places. He wants it to be a place that you do know you can trust him and that it's safe and that his wraparound presence and his love is there. And so this gold, you know, represents glory. Now listen, that butterfly was always made to fly and God's always seen it. If you were to take, this is a real true fact. I'm struggling. We're supposed to come along each other in our struggles. Don't get me wrong. Don't hear that extreme. But in a situation with a butterfly going into this intense, they're, they're coming out of their chrysalis. They're coming out. Their wings are starting to expand. It is in that place of struggle coming out of the cocoon that the fluid from the, their body fills the wings. If I came in and I cut that chrysalis to try and help that butterfly... I would stunt its growth. I would not, I would, I, it's that struggle that actually helps that butterfly to be what it was always meant to be. So we can embrace struggles that way, to see it as an opportunity for our wings to be strengthened in that place where we feel closed in, in that place where God is, is, is a wraparound love, is ensuring it's all going to be okay. Because that's a dark place in that chrysalis, right? That's, that's dark. We have to trust blind faith that he's making something awesome out of something I can't see, but he's doing because it's all about being first. It's all about that relationship with him. So I want to, um, if we can get ready, I, I think that uh, um, short film is ready. And I'm going to pray off, after we are, are done watching, and we'll just go into a time of prayer. And Raleigh, I'd love to have you come up on the keys at, at, at the end of this short film. And we'll just pray, because there's a lot of things. I want you to watch for God's heart in it. I know you'll see it. It's a beautiful. It's about God's grace is sufficient in our weakness. And his power is made perfect, and he redeems all things. So if I, uh, Chad, do you mind just, because uh, I don't see Jacob, where's Jacob? I just need to move this over, because I want this out of the way. Okay, we got right here. That's good. Riley, just move this over, because I want to. So it's called the Butterfly Circus. in my heart. We're all the circus you need, kid. But they have rides. Can we miss them enough? Why not? Let's go. Okay, boys, time to get me a date with the bearded lady. Who's with me? Great riches, come, sit down. I tell you all about your fate. Great riches, come. You're gonna come get you now. You're gonna get you if I can. <laughs> Pete Robinson, you got the fun with Sam, step right on in. Come on in, ladies and gentlemen, we have Lady Lulu. It's Pete Robinson, the fun with Sam. Come on in, ladies and gentlemen, come on in. We have the best show in town. Come on in, Mike, 
large heifer. She's a woman of extraordinary weight. That's a peculiar appetite for whole chickens. Now, down this way. The painted man. His world travels can be seen on every inch of his body, from head to toe. And now, ladies and gentlemen, gather in. A perversion of nature. A man, if you could even call him that, whom God himself has turned his back upon. I give you the limbless man. Oh, will you look at that? Look at him. <laughs> Move along, kids. Him. What's the matter with you? It's all right. No harm in it. My fault. Maybe I got a little too close, eh, friend? Have a good evening now. You better get a hold of yourself before the next show, Gimp. <laughs> Real nice, Will. <laughs> Seems you change your mind about going to one of them fancy shows. Mm -hmm. What are you saying? Don't you know nothing? That was Mendes. <laughs> you just spit on the showman from the Butterfly Circus. <laughs> Butterfly, butterfly. <laughs> you kill me, Will. <laughs> I'm hungry. I'm gonna get me some cotton candy. A man, if you can call him that, whom God himself has turned his back upon. The limbless man. Mmm, oh, muy bien. Get my trunk. It's so heavy. But it's easier for you because you're so strong. Da! Ah! There's a dead man in the truck. What? Well, now, look at this. This is wonderful. <laughs> Come on over by the fire. Warm up a bit, little man. <laughs> I'm Sammy. What's your name? I'm Will. What is your arms and legs? Sammy. What? Is he going to be in a circus now? Um, maybe I will. Hold on a minute. We don't have a sideshow here. What do you mean? Every circus has one. 
People come from all over the place to see us. And why do they come, Will? But, but yours could be different. No. There is nothing inspiring about immense imperfections on display. See, Will? We're happier here. And you can stay as long as you like. But I do run a different show. And now, one of the greatest displays of human contortion ever seen. It is my pleasure to introduce Anna, Queen of the Air. And the strongest man you'll ever see. Grounds, two days only. Come on by, Butterfly Circus, two days only. How do? My boy here would sure like to say hello to the strongest man in town. Well, I'm sure your daddy's stronger, but I'd make a close second. Wow. Are you in the show too, mister? Uh, um, no, not exactly. We best be going now. Thank you kindly. You bet. Wow, did you see that, Dad? I'm gonna be the strongest man in the world someday. I'm gonna be just like that man. I'll lift anything I want. Yeah, boy, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> And gentlemen, girls and boys, what this world needs is a little wonder. Look, Mama, baby! They move, full of strength, color and grace. They're astounding. But you? Curse from birth. A man, if you can call him that, who God himself turned his back upon. Stop it! Why would you say that? Because you. Beauty. 
that can come from ashes. <laughs> I say, they let you go too soon. Good luck out there. It's your problem now. You're no good to me, so get out! You're good enough for me, dollface. Here you go. But they're different from me. Yes, you do have an advantage. The greater the struggle, the more glorious the triumph. I can't find my caterpillar. Where is he? He's right there, in the cocoon, see? He'll be fine. You won't even recognize him when he comes out. Oh, wow. Hey! Hey, George! Poppy! I need help to cross! Can anyone help me? <laughs> hey, George! Can you help me? Hey, where are you going? What's the matter with you? Just gonna leave me here? I think you'll manage. What? <laughs> I guess I'll just magically get up, huh? Hey, George, puppy, how's the water? Ascending 50 feet into the air and leaping to this pool of water.
Wow, how did you do that, mister? <laughs> Were you scared? It was so high. seen that so many times and I still get choked up every time I see it you know I'm just the biggest thing that just keeps coming to mind is that we're just way too hard on ourselves beloved we're just too hard on ourselves God's not God's not hard on us that way his heart towards us is tender he's very serious about sin that keeps us from the fullness but the way he looks at us the way he sees things is different and I feel like we're invited in this morning to understand that through this visual and through just letting him directly speak to your heart. There's so many things that in that movie, you know, where the enemy would make our weaknesses like a freak show and make us feel like a freak in our weaknesses, right? And when God comes in and Sometimes people can't even receive him at first because they don't even know what that kind of love feels like. They don't even know, and they spit in his face because it's like you're getting too close to something that is so painful. But what I love about that in that moment is you see that God can handle our real process. Religion and masking things gets in the way. Being real with God, even having it out with him, even being like God, he handles real process really well. But trying to dart the issue, skirt the issue, look, justify, it's all squirming in the place where God's like, just let me love you right there, right there. And so you see, I just love how he walks out. And, and so he starts to pursue something that he saw in this man that saw something in him that he didn't understand. He, he thought it'd be just good to stay a freak show. Uh, I can just eat the scraps at my father's table. I can just settle for the scraps. I can. Uh, unworthiness says that, right? And so here we are, you know, here it is. He's like, I'll just settle for the scraps and, and I'll be a freak show for you. And he's like, no, come on, there's nothing. What was it? It was nothing inspiring about imperfections on display. God wants to take imperfections and put strength, bring the things that are imperfections, and through the, his love and the way he sees us and the power of his grace transform us. We see people, a strong man, once strong, and in bar fights, beating people up, using his strength in a, in a, for using his strength in a place of pain and brokenness. And the next thing you know, you see strength on display in a different way. <laughs> you know, and you see a woman who was like thrown out by the world, prostituted, wor said you're worth this nickel, thrown on the ground. And God said, I see something different. I see, I see something different. I see the beauty inside of you and how if you'll choose the, the body that was used in just in terrible ways, I'm going to make display my beauty from the highest place, like, and so there she is, you know, displaying beauty from that place. I just love it. I love, like, the imagery and, and Poppy, oh, you're too old. You're washed up. Ha, ah, not according to God. <laughs> not according to the perspective of heaven. So, God, this morning we just resist the, the accusations of the enemy who would try and put our imperfections on display. God, we ask for you to come into those places where the enemy is having a field day, where he is just poking and prodding and, and, and just trying to make us into like 
our places of pain and weakness into a freak show. God, that's not how you see it. It's not how you see it. That's not how you see us. So God, as we see these places of imperfection, as we see these places and he challenges, what do you believe about yourself? What do you believe about yourself? He challenged him, said, you'll be a freak if you see yourself as a freak. If all you see is your weaknesses, if all you see is your pain, you will stay in that place. But I'm calling you into something more. I want you to see yourself. I want you to see people around you according to my, the way God sees. And he sees beyond the imperfections. He sees beyond the imperfections and he calls something out. He said, just believe me to transform the very thing that was your weakness into something just so stunning. And you'll always know it's because of me. You'll always know you won't be able to take credit because you'll always know it was because of him. And, and, and it'll be a beautiful display and I just love that. He said that one of the lines, the greater the struggle the more glorious the triumph. Can we remember that in our struggles? Let's just grab a hold of that. The more, the greater the struggle, the, the more glorious the triumph. So God, I just thank you for grace this morning. I was so inspired by grace. And God, would you help us not to be so hard on ourselves, beating ourselves up in places of weakness, but inviting and seeing that you see us you see the butterfly. We might be a caterpillar. We might be in a chrysalis. We might be struggling in that place. But God, you always see the butterfly. You see the end from the beginning. And you help us in our struggles. You help us in our times of need. You bring grace. You empower us. Grace empowers us to be all that we can be. Not to stay in the struggle. Not to stay in self-pity. Not to stay in a place that identifies with pain but in a place that identifies with your heart, in a place that we identify with the very heart of God that says, I will call you, I'm calling you out of that dark place. I'm calling you into my glorious light. So God, let us embrace, embrace the grace in a whole new measure, a whole new way from this day forward. Let us enter into new places of understanding your heart. So I'm just, we're just going to give it a little space. I, sometimes we get some food and we need a little time to digest. Spiritual food's the same way. You just got served some, this beautiful plate of grace. This, and you're partaking of that grace. Now we're just going to leave some time. Raleigh's just going to keep playing. And we're just going to digest that and let God speak to you. Let him show you whatever he wants to show you. And then we're going to open up a time for some, pers for some prayer. Who you are. Let him reveal how he really feels and sees you. 